hymns this morning. Take your hymnals. Turn to page 468, Joy Unspeakable. We'll sing all four verses. Stand if you're able. I have found his grace is all see the new pulpit, isn't it? Y'all see it? And uh, now let me just, I need to demonstrate this for your all sake so you know this. Now this, when you're short like myself uh, and you use these multi, multi-focal contacts, it's hard to really focus on something uh, that's, that's high up close to you. So uh, this is custom made uh, pulpit that comes down to my level. <laughs> this is good. This is good. So praise the Lord. Uh, I don't know that there's another one like this in America, uh, but we have it. So praise the Lord. Let's uh, open in a word of prayer. Father, thank you so much for allowing us to be together again this morning. I say it so often, but Lord, I mean it from the bottom of my heart. Thank you that you give us a place to meet. Thank you that we have a reason to meet, to glorify your name and to praise your son who saved our soul. And Father, if there's anyone here this morning who can't give that testimony, who doesn't know for certain if they died today, they'd have an everlasting home in heaven. And Father, I pray that your Holy Spirit might work on that soul and convict them enough to convert them this morning, cause them to know Christ as their Savior, and make a change in their life. I pray your will will be done in every facet of our service this morning. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated.
turn to page 596, Victory in Jesus. We'll sing all three verses. Stand if you're able. Page 596. I heard an old, old story How a Savior came from glory How he gave his life on Calvary To save a wretch like me I heard about his groaning Of his precious blood's atoning Then I repented of my sin And won the victory Oh, victory in Jesus My Savior forever He sought me and he bought me with his redeeming blood he loved me ere i knew him and all my love is to him he plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood i heard about his healing of his cleansing power he made the lame to walk again and caused the blind to see. And then I cried, dear Jesus, come and heal my broken spirit. And somehow Jesus came and brought to me the victory. Oh, victory in Jesus my Savior forever. He sought me and he bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him and all my love is to him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing I heard about a mansion he has built for me in glory. And I heard about the streets of gold beyond the crystal sea. About the angels singing and the old redemption story. And some sweet day I'll sing up there the song of victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and he bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me do him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. Amen. And because that victory is in Jesus, he is my Savior forever. Praise the Lord. Glad you're here this morning. Please remain standing for a few announcements. First of all, congratulations to Andrew Sims and Benji Gilly who tied for the teacher with the highest increase week number two. Good job, fellas. Glad to see some men classes winning. Amen. And then uh, thank you to all those who came out for Spring for the King work days on Friday and Saturday. Lots of work got done. Thank you so much for taking it your, a part and in, in investing in your church. There, just as a reminder, there will be no Spanish class today, but it will resume next Sunday. So if you've been going to the Spanish class, not today, but next Sunday, that will pick back up at 4 o'clock. Today, we'll have choir practice at 5 o'clock. If you've been thinking about joining the choir, great day to do so. And then March the 19th, there will be no fourth quarter Saints activity this month. Looking forward to the activity in April. Then this Tuesday is also the presidential preference primary elections. You've got to be registered 
according to party in order to, to vote in that in the state of Florida. So if you're eligible, exercise your right to vote. And then at the end of this month, we're having our Resurrection Sunrise Service, 6.30 a.m., Bayview Park Pier. Please note 6.30 is a change to the, to the time that's in the calendar. Regular services will follow that. If you've got any questions, please let us know. Now let's take just a few moments and greet those around you. As you make your way back to your seats, turn to page 587 at Calvary. We'll sing the first, second, the last. Stand if you're able. Page 587. Years I spent in vanity and pride, caring not my Lord was crucified, knowing not it was for me he died on Calvary. there was great and grace was free pardon there was multiplied to me there my burdened soul found liberty at Calvary now my sin I learned then I trembled at the law I'd spurned till my guilty soul imploring turned to Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free. Then there was multiplied to me. There my burdened soul found liberty at Calvary. On the last, oh, the love that drew salvation's plan. Oh, the grace that brought it down to man. Oh, the mighty gulf that God did span at Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free. Pardon there was multiplied to me. There my burdened soul found liberty at Calvary. Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus, we thank you, Lord, for the sacrifice of your son that we might all have eternal life, Lord. And we pray today, if there's anyone here that doesn't know that, doesn't know how to get saved, that they'll talk to someone and get saved today. Lord, we thank you for our speaker. Pray you fill him with your spirit, Lord. Just uh, let him have exactly what we need to hear. And Lord, we thank you for this offering. May it be used for your honor and your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.
trust in Jesus, he made my heart so glad. That I threw away my frowning face, for I could not be sad. Oh, let the joy of Jesus put a smile upon your face. And let the joy of Jesus every little frowny raise. Proclaim his grace with a happy face. Let his glory shine. And show the joy of Jesus on your face. Have you ever met a Christian who only could complain? Have you ever met a gloomy grump who always was in pain? Oh, let the joy of Jesus put a smile upon your face. And let the joy of Jesus every little frowny race. Proclaim his grace with a happy face. Let his glory shine and show the joy of Jesus on your face. Oh, let the joy of Jesus put a smile upon your face. And let the joy of Jesus every little frowny race. Proclaim his grace with a happy face. Let his glory shine and show the joy of Jesus on your face. Proclaim his grace with a happy face, let his glory shine, and show the joy of Jesus on your face. All right, we've got a special treat uh, this morning. The, uh, the fellow that built this is going to speak, but that, that's because he's more than just a builder. He's a multi-talented preacher. Uh, it just kills me, these guys, that God gives them these gifts, and, you know, he, he keeps them from me. But nevertheless, uh, he's first a word. I, I put this together. He's first a word worker. He's following in the steps of his father, who was an evangelist. Uh, Brother Monty Watts, who will be our speaker, uh, was saved at the age of nine. He felt called to preach as an as evangelist at, at, as early as 11 years old and tra ha traveling with his father in evangelism. He's also a sword worker, as you see in the back. Uh, he's a collector and a curator of historic and antique Bibles and biblical works. Uh, he possesses approximately 400 pieces, and those back there are not even half of what he has, uh, but he's brought those uh, uh, to, to, to share with us. And then, finally, he's a wood worker, as you see, uh, from a beautiful customized pulpit uh, that he builds, and, and he's got seven yet to build. It's people are waiting in line to get these, so he's building seven more. Uh, he also does, uh, uh, re, re, uh, does uh, what's it called, remodeling work of platforms and, and repairs of churches that have problems, and also parsonages, and so it's too bad I don't have a parsonage that he's working on, but he does good work, and it's good to, good to have Brother Monty Watts with us this morning. God bless. He's going to introduce his wife. Good morning. We are thankful to be here. I have my wife, Sandy, is with me. My um, daughter, we, we usually travel as a family. And we have for 10 and a half years now. There's been very, very few, probably five, six, maybe seven meetings where I've gone by myself. Um, I love the fact that we get to travel as a family. And it's a family ministry, and we're thankful for that. But my daughter... Um, she turned 17 in January last Thursday she got her driver's license so we have prayer cards on our table back there please <laughs> grab one of those <laughs> please pray for us but um, our home church is doing a youth takeover day today and they had asked my daughter if there was any way she could be there to play the piano for the, for the whole day so she is a nervous wreck but she's doing that today and she's, we're thankful for her spirit and willingness to serve but we do miss her when she's not with us. Um, is, she is a vital part of our ministry as well. But we are thankful, so thankful to be here. Um, as Preacher mentioned, um, we have a multi, multi-faceted ministry. And preachers will call. Um, your pastor called me, asked me about a pulpit. It's been a while now um, because it does, I can only build them when I'm home. And God uh, really blessed our ministry. Last year we were um, in over 
70 different churches, 70 different meetings. God allowed us to travel and preach. And so we were, my daughter and I sat down and figured out one time, we were home less than, less than 100 days last year total. And I can only build pulpits when we're home at the shop. So it takes a little bit to get them, get them done. But um, we are thankful for the ministry that God allows us to have. We are Nehemiah ministry. We, we have the sword and the trowel. Uh, as you've noticed, some of you may have noticed some. Uh, we'll point out now we have part of our antique Bible and biblical books back there. That preacher mentioned that's about one-fourth of our display that God gave to us. Um, we are so honored and humbled and privileged to have that display that we get to carry. And uh, we get to do a lot of conferences on the history of the Bible and why we use the King James and just really try our, our focus with carrying that is to encourage God's people that we have the word of God now use the word of God and that's what we want to encourage uh, to exhort one another with those words and so we we are thankful that we get to carry them and I will just mention quickly um feel free to take pictures um, we don't put them under glass so that you can take pictures we do try to be careful with them as much as possible so we do ask that you don't touch them and I always say it's easy for me to say, please don't touch, because I get to touch them. <laughs> so I can put the signs up there. Brother, Brother John Sawyer had signs with them that one said, if you were 400 years old, you wouldn't want to be picked up either. <laughs> and he had another one that said, last guy picked me up, broke my spine, so leave me where I'm at. But we, we just put, please do not touch, and um, ask that you just... If you would like to see a certain passage, though, in one of the old Bibles, a uh, special verse or a passage, just let my wife or I know, and we'll turn the pages for you if you want to take a picture of that. Um, but thank you again, preacher, for allowing us to be here. Um, that's, that's one part of our ministry. Another part that we have is the, the building and the woodworking. We're thankful that God allows us and gives us the health for that. I will just mention it quickly. I'm, I've been using power tools on my own since I was 10 years old. So 39 years, and about four weeks ago now, four or five weeks ago, I got my first stitches from a power tool, and I did it right, um, and by that, I mean I did it, it was wrong, it was horrible, but um, I had a, I was drilling through a piece of metal, I had it clamped in a vise, and it came out of the vise, and I was holding this side, I had it in the vise on this side, I'm drilling through, and it came out of the vise, when it came out, I jerked my hand back, and I'm like, oh, okay, that could have been bad. And I looked down, and there's blood all over the floor. And I said, okay, maybe it is bad. So I looking, and I had sliced my wrist here, had stuck it down in my wrist. And uh, so I had to get a quick tourniquet on that. Went and got my wife. I walked in the house, and I had my shirt tied around it tight. And I said, um, I've cut myself, and I'm pretty sure I need stitches this time. And she said, what would you do? And she turned, and she said, yeah, I think so. My whole shirt's, well, you know. If you're, if you're cut here, it's going to bleed pretty good. So got to the emergency room, got stitches on that, but it could have been so much worse. They said I just missed the artery there. Um, and if I would have hit the artery there, this would be my funeral. <laughs> I wouldn't be here preaching. So, um, but that being said, that, that's, one of the, you know, that's one of the reasons why we covet your prayers for our ministry. Um, I know that God protects us sometimes in spite of us. <laughs> But um, we are thankful for those that pray for us and are willing to lift our ministry up. And so we have, you know, the multifaceted, we do the different things. We do the remodeling, we do the pulpits, we have the antique Bibles. And it's amazing to me, even, even yet, though, I know you all had Brother Garraway here recently, and he's a dear friend of ours. We, we love the Garraway family. But <laughs> they, they sing. They're wonderful singers. And people call, and they ask, okay, we heard about you have over a million dollars worth of antique Bibles that you can bring and display. And I will mention more about that this evening as well, how we got the Bibles and some of the older ones, some of their stories. And I said, yes, sir. And you can build me a new pulpit. Yes, sir. And you'll come preach for us. Yes, sir. I'd love to. Oh, before I let you go, Brother Watts, do you sing? No. There's a reason God gave me the other talents. Because there is nobody in this room, well, I say there's nobody in this room that wants to hear me sing, and there would be nobody in this room if I got up and sang. So um, we do not sing, but we are thankful for those that do, but we don't, and, um, but that is a little bit of an introduction to us. I'm Monty Watts Jr. My dad was an evangelist for 25 years, traveled and preached. Um, God used
used him in a great way. He went to heaven Christmas 2011, and we miss him. Um, but I'm thankful for my heritage. I'm thankful for men of God who has, have stood strong, who hold on to the word of God, who preach the word of God. And I'm thankful for that, and it's, um, I'm thankful to follow in his footsteps. I'm not, I had a preacher, t- you know, his dad, my dad used to preach for his dad, and he said, we have big shoes to fill. I said, no, no, I'm not trying to fill my dad's shoes. God's given me the ministry that I have that he wants me to serve him through, but I will follow in the footsteps of my dad because I see whose faith follow. I see the end of the conversation. I see where his life led to, and I see how when he went to heaven, there was not an ounce of scandal around his name. He's never compromised. He stood strong. He stood true, and that's how that I can follow. That's footsteps. I can follow because it leads me toward Christ. And so I'm thankful for my heritage. I'm thankful for that. Um, And thank you again, Preacher, for the invite, for allowing me to stand here. Um, That Pastor Adams is the shepherd of this flock. He's he's the under-shepherd that God has put here, that God has trusted with this pulpit. And for him to trust me with the pulpit this morning, I never take that lightly. I'm thankful for that, and I thank you pastor for for the invite and for the honor of standing here if you would turn with me second timothy chapter three second timothy chapter three i brought one of our bibles with me to the pulpit this bible was printed in 1613 this is a king james bible this is the first king james bible printed this size the 1611, the original King James Bible, the first one that came off the press, they were trying to get an accurate copy of the Word of God into every church, and so it's called the pulpit Bible, the pulpit size. But then they realized that the person in the pew, the layman, the folks that are listening to the preacher, need a copy of the Word of God themselves. That is very important. Because at that time, there was, there, it was, Ill, there was many places it was, it was illegal for you to own a copy of the word of God. Why would that be? Because the person behind the pulpit was preaching heresy and was teaching heresy. And if you had a copy of the word of God, then you would identify that and you would have the truth in your hand and could verify that they're not preaching. When I preach the word of God, when I stand behind a pulpit, I want you to have a copy of the word of God in your hand. Because I want you to verify that what I'm saying is the word of God. It's not my opinion, it's not me is what God has given to us. And so this Bible was the first one printed this size for the common person to have a copy of the Word of God in their hand. To purchase this Bible at that time, the average person working the average job salary, it would cost them one year's wages to have one copy of the Word of God. Oh, how grateful and thankful we should be that we have the Word of God in our hand. So, in 2 Timothy chapter 3, I am actually going to read my text from this Bible. Again, this Bible is 411 years old. And I'm going to read from it, and um, I'll just, there, there's so many arguments people say, if you had an actual 1611 in your hand, you wouldn't be able to read it anyway. We're going to read from it this morning. It is, it's not like sitting down because our brain is not accustomed to the font and the spelling, but you can read it. So don't, don't listen to the naysayers, just trust God. Um, 2 Timothy chapter 3, I'm going to begin reading in verse 14. The Bible says, But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned, and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. God's word is preserved for us today. We have it in our hand, and that's just a little testimony to that. You know, we see a Bible that's over 400 years old, and it reads the same as what you have in your hand today. It helps us to understand that God's Word is eternal. This morning, I want to look at the thought, God's blueprint. God's blueprint, the Word that we have in our hand. And let's pray. 
Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you again for this morning. Lord, we thank you for the, the Sunday school lesson that we heard, Lord, and the faithfulness of Jeremiah. Lord, just preaching your message. Lord, we, we preach your word because you've commanded us to. And Lord, we, we give the sense of it. But Lord, we know it's you that does the work. Lord, I pray that you just work in my heart this morning, in the heart of each and every person that is here or listening. Lord, I pray that you would help us as only you can. Lord, I pray that you would just please move amongst us and draw us closer to you. Lord, if there is someone here this morning that does not know you as their personal Savior, Lord, please show them their need of your salvation. Convict their heart before it is eternally too late. Lord, we love you and trust you for these things. In Jesus' name, amen. I mentioned this morning, I want to look at the thought, God's blueprint. All We read here in our text, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. The first thing we see that all scripture is of divine origin. Here we see the proclamation of the divine origin of scripture. It is God's word. In the Old Testament, it's reiterated over 2,600 times that we have the words of God in our hand. In the New Testament, Jesus himself reaffirms this. He, re, he tells us in Matthew 22, verse 31, Jesus quoting, he said, But as touching the resurrection of the dead, have ye not read that which was spoken unto you by God, saying, I am the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. We serve a living God today. Christ here, he's quoting from Exodus chapter 3 and verse 6. Jesus, he said, have ye not read? But you notice he did not say, have ye not read that which was penned by Moses? No. He said, have ye not read that which was spoken unto you by God? He said, you have God's word. It's the word of God. It's the God-breathed word that God spoke and we see that it is his word, and we see that proclaimed throughout the word of God. Matthew 5.18 says, For verily I say unto you, Till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall not pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Every letter, every mark which is used to form the words, the sentences, the books, the entire Bible, God's word is proclaimed to be from God. It's his word, and we can trust him for it. We can hold him at his word. Second, we see the production of the Holy Scripture in 2 Peter 1.21. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. The holy men of God, we see the production here. First, we saw it was proclaimed by the inspiration of God, and second, we see the obedience of the men of God as they wrote what God would have them to write. We see it substantiated. The Bible, God's word, was produced by these holy men moved by the Holy Ghost. They wrote what God would have them to write. One example we have of that is in Job 26, verse 7. He stretcheth out the north over the empty place and hangeth the earth upon nothing. The people at this time still believed the earth was flat, that the earth was supported from underneath. And yet here's Job writing these words, not of his own wisdom, not of his own. He'd never been out in space and looked back and saw the earth hanging here. He'd never seen any of that, but he wrote that the earth hangeth upon nothing because it was the words of God that he was writing. It was from God's wisdom, not his own. In Matthew 5, 18, and back in, again, it says, For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall not pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Matthew 24, 35, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. God's word is eternal, it is permanent. We saw the proclamation and divine origin of the word of God. We saw the production as holy men of God were moved by the Holy Ghost to pen the words of God. And we see the permanency of the word of God. It shall not pass away. We mention often we carry the antique Bibles and we think, man, this Bible is over 400 years old. That's a long time. But when you look at eternity, that is but just a minute fraction of time. And, but God gives us these examples to help us to try to understand that he is eternal. His word is eternal for us today. So... Uh, Hopefully, these first three points are just a reminder to us as Christians. It's just a reminder to us. I want to ask you why this is so important. Why is it so important to understand this for each and every individual to understand these points? Romans 1.16 tells us, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believe it, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Hebrews 4.12 tells us, For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. God's word is our power. It is our power. 
Romans 10, 17 tells us, so then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. The word of God that we have in our hand is how we know God. It's how we've learned to know him. It's, it's how we know God's simple plan of salvation. It's how we know his plan for forgiveness of our sins. It's how we learn to know our Savior. It's how we grow closer and closer to God. And the word of God is the power that God gives us to live for him, but it also is a power unto salvation. My wife is from Hazard, Kentucky. She was born and raised in Hazard, Kentucky. And her, her dad was a very evil, wicked man. He um, worked in the coal mines. I say evil and wicked because he purposely would try to hurt people. He would do things to try to hurt people. He left her when she was just a very young child. And I want to say thank you, but just a moment to say thank you for running your buses, for picking folks up for church. My wife was reached to a bus ministry, a Bible Baptist church in Hazard, Kentucky. Dr. Sam Fugit went by, knocked on the door, invited them, led her mom to the Lord, and she began riding the bus at six weeks old. We are thankful for the bus ministries across this nation. But her dad left when she was just a very young child. Her dad, I mentioned he worked in the coal mines. And he was very purposeful in his meanness. He was an alcoholic, and one time him and his brother-in-law were out drinking, and they got drunk, and his brother-in-law had a brand-new Corvette that he had just purchased. Now, Hazard, Kentucky is in the mountains of Kentucky. And so after they had been out drinking, they decided to go race that Corvette through those mountains. Her dad was driving, Clifford was driving, and they're going through all those hairpin curves and those mountains, up and down those mountains. And then, as you would know, they, they misjudged one of the curves. They went off the, the embankment there, went airborne, and went into a tree. His brother-in-law was killed immediately. Clifford walked away with just a scratch on his forehead. It wasn't long after that, after working in the coal mines and smoking his entire life, he kept getting harder and harder to breathe and he kept putting it off and finally he went to the doctor and the doctor said you have stage four lung cancer there's nothing we can do we'll put you on oxygen and we're going to send you home they put him on oxygen they sent him home and he's home for several years living that way wondering how he's still alive one day his friend came by and said hey Clifford I'm going down to the corner store would you do you need anything he said, yeah, I've really been craving some orange juice. Would you get me some orange juice? His friend came back in a little bit with a gallon of orange juice, and Clifford sat there and began drinking it. When his wife came home later, he's sitting in his chair with an empty gallon jug of orange juice beside him. She began talking to him, and he just stared at the wall, and he would mumble incoherently. She couldn't figure out. He's just mumbling, staring at the wall. She realized that there was something wrong, and then she realized there was something bad wrong. So she got him to the doctor. She got him outside, got him to the doctor. The doctor tried to run some tests, so we got to get him to the hospital right now. They got him to the hospital, and his blood sugar was 1496. They said with his other health issues and everything, we honestly don't know why he's still alive. We're going to put him in the bed. We're going to put a saline drip on him, call the family, and tell them to say their goodbyes. Three days later, a nurse came in, and she's writing on the chart, and she hears a voice say, hey, what am I doing here? She jumped out of her skin, and she turned around, and Clifford had sat up in the bed. And she said, we don't know. We thought you'd be dead by now. We don't know why you're still alive. A couple weeks later, my wife gets a phone call and says, is there any way you all could come through? You see... During that time, before he went into the hospital, we would go by and try to see him. And he knew that I was a preacher. He knew that I was, had gone to Bible college. So even though he wasn't drinking at that time, whenever we were there, he would purposely have some sort of open alcoholic beverage on his table just to see how I would respond. He would try to tell an off-color joke just to see how I'd react. So we decided that there was no way we we're going to take my daughter over there when she was born because we're not going to submit her to that. So we just kept praying and kept praying. And all those years, her mom kept sending the preachers by, knocking on his door, trying to give him the gospel. And he would all but throw them off the, off the, off the porch. 
He wanted nothing to do with the, with the gospel. He wanted nothing to do with God. My wife, after the, the hospital, my wife got a call and said, is there any way you all can come by and see us? Clifford wants to talk to Monty. We prayed about it for a couple days, and we went by. We stopped in there, and we got out, and her stepmom came around, gave her a big hug, and said, Monty, you need to get in there right now. I walked in, I walked around the corner, and there sat Clifford in his chair. He looks up at me, and he goes, hey, brother Monty. And my first thought was, here we go again. Here we go. You know, immediately skeptical. And then I realized that there may have been a different tone in his voice. And I said, hey, Clifford. He said, sit down, let me tell you something. He told me the story that I just told you. He said, when I woke up and I asked the nurse and she said, we don't know why you're still alive. I told her, I do. I need to get home. He said, I came home and I sat down in this chair and I picked up that old King James Bible right there and I began reading it. He said, I did not leave the chair. I never turned the TV on. The only time I left the chair was to use the washroom. He said, in seven days, I sat here and started at Genesis 1, Genesis 1 and read all the way through the Bible. He said, Monty, when I finished Revelation 22, I bowed my head and said, Lord, best I know how, God, please be merciful to me, a sinner. And I accepted God's free gift of eternal life. He said, now I have questions. And he picked up a yellow big yellow legal pad and there's all these questions he said I've been reading the Bible and I want to know more I want to know more why because God's word is power unto salvation he read the word of God he saw his need for the salvation of Christ he saw how Christ died on the cross for him how Jesus shed his blood and gave his life was buried in a borrowed tomb and three days later gloriously rose from the dead proving victory over death and hell and he said, I need to accept God's free gift of eternal life. Every time we go by there now, every time we go through, he has a list of questions. He wants to know more and more about the Bible. He wants to know more and more about God. Why? Because God's word will change your life. It is the word that God has given to us. In Acts chapter 1, we're given this, the, the account of Jesus, how he, um, he's, been, he's, he's trained the disciples. He died on the cross. Can you imagine being one of those apostles that got to see? It's sad that they were far off, but saw our Savior as he was brutally tortured and hung on that cross. They watched as he was buried and he rose again. And now here they are in Acts chapter 1. They're back on the, the, uh, the mountainside there with him. And in verse 6 it says, When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times of the seasons which a father hath put in his own power, but ye shall receive power. After that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. And when he had spoken those things while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. They have seen Je that Jesus has come back to life. He's been resurrected. He's standing there before them. He's standing there talking to them. And they said, okay, Lord, now's the time you're going to restore your kingdom, right? Now we get to reign with you. And he said, no, not right now. The Father knows the time. He said, but ye shall receive power. Now I can imagine Peter at that moment saying, oh yes, okay, give me power. Where am I going to reign? Who am I going to govern over? And Jesus said, but ye shall receive power. But it's not power to govern and reign at that time. It's the power that after that the Holy Ghost has, has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses. Ye shall be witnesses unto me. A witness is someone who tells what they personally have seen and heard. What God has personally done in your life. Oh, that we would be faithful to be a witness. I mention this often, how, how wonderful it would be if Christ were to come back as I'm handing somebody a gospel track. I want to be caught at the very moment of serving God and telling others. But how many of us will be, will, will be caught? Why stand ye gazing up into heaven? So many of us will be caught gazing 
when God has given us a command, he's given us something to do, and he's given us the power to do so. Through his word, through the Holy Ghost, we are to go out and reach the world for Christ, to do everything we can to share the gospel with every person that we can. I recently built a garage um, at, our, at my home there that I used for a shop to build the pulpits. And so I, I had to run the power from the house 125 feet out, underground, over to the shop, in to a sub panel, set up, ran out of that, and put the outlets in. The inspector came by, gave me a green tag. He said, you're good to go. But that's not where it ends. See, now I take the tools that I have, and I plug them into those outlets, and I use those tools to make a difference. I use those tools to build the pulpits, to build these things, for, to help churches, to help pastors. And we... In our hand have the outlet of power that God has given to us. But we are commanded to plug into that outlet to allow ourselves to be used as a tool in God's hand. To allow God to use us to reach others so that we can use the power that God gives us through his word and watch the power of God as it reaches others for Christ. The power of God unto salvation. The power of God whereby we live our lives for Christ. Matthew 28 18, 19, 20, and Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. Jesus said, I have all power, I have all authority. It is mine. He said, But now I'm telling you to go therefore. Go out and reach every person. Tell them about me. Tell them about Christ. Share with them what God has done in your life so that God can use you as a testimony to show them what Christ has done for them as well. He said, but I'm not just sending you out. All that power, all the authority, I'm going with you. And we are going hand in hand with Christ as we are reaching others to know him. We ought to be busy to promote the word of God promoting the word of God. God is with us and his power is available to us. We are to promote God's word to others. Advertise it. Share it with every person that we can. Use the available power. And to do so, God has told us in his word that he has an individual plan for each and every one of us. If we are to know this plan, we must read God's word. 2 Timothy 2.15 tells us, study to show thyself approved unto God. It's perfect. It's you. We are to study the word of God. We look at our text verse, and he tells us, All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. Everything in this world, every person you talk to, they're looking to make a profit. They're looking for something that's profitable. Oh, we have it. We have it. For this is a treasure that God has given to each and every one of us that we have in our hand so that we can serve him, so that we can know him. It is profitable. It is valuable for our doctrine. Our doctrine is that's our foundation, our belief. It's how we know God. For reproof, that is the, the, uh, to show us the error of our way. And for correction, not to show us where we went wrong, but how to fix it. And for instruction in righteousness. Instruction in righteousness, it shows us how to live our lives for God. We call it our handbook, our guidebook, our blueprint. It's the blueprint that God has given to us that we need to study so we can see the plan that God has for each and every individual person. When you're building a building, everybody gets a copy of the blueprint. The, the framers, the, the, the roofers, the plumbers, the electrician, the excavators, everybody gets a copy of the blueprint. Everybody has to know the common goal. Everybody has to know what we're trying to build. But each person studies the blueprint to see what their job is to get that building built. The electrician has to know where to put the outlets. The plumber has to know where to put the fixtures, where to put the drains. And if you've ever been on a job site, the electricians and plumbers don't always get along. Just throw that out there. I'm a carpenter, so they all hate me. But anyway... <laughs> But um, so here we are. We have a copy of the blueprint so that we can have the goal. We can see the common goal, what we're trying to build. And then we study the blueprint and see what our individual plan is toward that goal. God's given us his blueprint for your life, for my life. 
And we are to study the word of God. Each one of us knows the common goal. The goal is to bring others to know Christ and to teach them, to disciple them so that they too can go reach others. But each one of us, God has given us different callings, different plans for each and every one of us. But in order to know so, we need to study the word of God and be yielded to the Holy Spirit. Allow him to guide us into all truth and to highlight, to illuminate God's word. God has different gifts, different callings for different people. But we all have an individual plan for God giving, given to us through his word. Oh, that we would be faithful to study the blueprint, to know what God has individually for each of us to do. God's not called everybody to be a pastor. If he did, there'd be nobody in the pew. God's not called everybody to be an evangelist. God's not called, but he has called every one of us to be a witness. He's called every one of us to do our part to reach others for Christ. We've seen the proclamation of divine origin of God's word. The production of God's word as holy men of God were moved by the Holy Ghost. We've seen the permanency of God's word. It shall not pass away. We've seen the power of God's word unto salvation and, and to live our lives for him. The promotion of God's word to win souls, to tell others. And lastly, let's look at the place of God's word in your life. What place does God's word have in your life? I received a phone call. Just a few months after my dad passed away, my dad wrote a biography called From an Iron Lung to a Pulpit. It was his life story. I received a phone call from a man. He said, I'm, uh, he, actually, my wife answered the phone. He asked for my dad. She said, no, but she came out and said, do you want to talk to him? I said, yeah, I'll talk to him. He said, I just read a book called From an Iron Lung to a Pulpit. He said, I'm 81 years old. And I got so encouraged, I had to go tell somebody about Christ. He said, I saw this man's life and how God used him, and I have to get out here and tell somebody. And I just wanted to try to reach out to see if I could get a hold of the author of that book and say thank you for writing it. I said, well, you just missed him. He's in heaven. I said, but I'm his son, Monty Jr. I'm little Monty. I know that's hard to believe, but I was called little Monty at one time. And he began to weep. He said, I just went, went online and Googled Monty Watts, and this is the number that came up. I said, yeah, there's not a whole lot of us out there. <laughs> it's a very unique name. I said, but I'm thankful you called. And we had a great time of fellowship and prayer, and we're both crying and praying, and then we hung up. And I hung up the phone, and I began to think. You know, he was so excited that he got to talk to the son of the author. But we have a book in our hand, and as a Christian, we have direct access to the author himself. To God himself and to his son, the one who died for us. But are we willing to take that word, that book that we have in our hand, and put it first place in our lives? Is it our priority to believe it, to trust it, to know it? to proclaim the word of God and to live our lives for him, telling others about him. When you use God's power, there is no stopping what you can do for him. The place of God's word in your life will be shown. It will be manifest by your desire, by your willingness to tell others, to do his work, to follow his plan for your life. In the 1970s, there was a, young cripple man just gotten married and they had a little baby girl and he was looking for a job and there wasn't a lot of programs and stuff like there are now and so he was having a hard time trying to find a job one day his neighbor came home and said hey I just quit my job up here at the jeep garage I think if you go up there and ask for Henry he's the owner I think he'd hire you the young man went up there that right then left and went up there and he walked into the shop and it's a very large Jeep dealership and he walked in, there's a garage door open and there's a man in there sweeping the bay. So he just walked in and the man looked up and said, hey, how can I help you? The young cripple man said, I'm looking for the owner. I'm supposed to ask for Henry. The guy leaned the broom over and said, I'm Henry. I'm the owner. He was kind of shocked that he's the owner of this large place. He's out here sweeping the floor. He said, well, I've been told that you might be looking for somebody, my neighbor. And he gave his name. He said, uh, just quit. And he told me you might hire me. 
Henry looked at him. He said, I hate to do this, but I'm going to ask you. He said, I see your condition. He said, is there, uh, what can you offer me? The young man said, I'll outwork every healthy person you have in this place. Henry said, well, with that promise, I'll see you tomorrow morning at 8 o'clock. Next morning, a young man went up there. He went in at 8 o'clock. He got ready to work, and they began to work. But he realized something very quickly, that the hardest working place person on the place, the hardest working person he had to outwork was Henry, the boss. He's not hiding in a corner office behind who pulling the blind. No, he's out there working with the men. And every day he would blow the whistle and bring all the men into the cafeteria for lunch. And Henry would sit down and he'd pull out an old worn out New Testament. And he'd lay it down and he'd begin reading that New Testament. And he would get excited about what he was reading in the Word of God. And he would call one of the men's names and be like, hey, hey, look at this, I just read this. He said, this, Jesus just healed this young person. He, he just gave this blind man his sight or whatever it was he was reading. He'd get excited about what he was reading and he would bring it up and he would mention, he would tell the, peop- tell the men that were there working for him. One day, the young crippled man's at home with his wife and he just told her, he said, I'm wore out. I've been trying to outwork my boss all day. He said, the only thing I want to do is eat a little bit of supper watch a little bit of TV and go to bed. He ate his supper and he's headed for the couch to watch a little bit of TV and he heard a knock on the door. He stopped and opened the door and there stood Henry, his boss. And Henry's wife was with him. He said, can I help you? And Henry said, I'm out visiting from my church. It's Thursday night and this is what I do every Thursday. I'm out visiting from my church. And God put you all on my heart. And I wanted to come by and talk to you. Is there any way I'd come in? The young cripple man said, There's, I was tired. I did not want him to come in. I wanted to go to bed. But because of his testimony at work, I let him come into the house that night. He said his wife, the two wives went in the living room, and Henry took his employee to the kitchen table. He said, let me ask you a question. He said, if you died right now, do you know for sure you'd go to heaven? The young man said, no, as a matter of fact, I know I wouldn't. He said, well, if I can show you from the Bible how you can know for sure, would you let me? The young man said, yes, and Henry reached in his pocket. In the same tracks that you have back here, he pulled out a God's simple plan of salvation track. He said, I'm not a preacher, I'm not a pastor, but I'm here to tell you about Christ. He said, I'm going to take this, I'm going to follow this, and we're going to open my New Testament, and you can read God's word for yourself as we go. And he began to go down the Romans road, went through God's simple plan of salvation. And about 35 minutes later, that young crippled man, my dad, bowed his head and trusted Christ as his Savior wasn't long after that my dad began going to church God called him to preach he went into event he was an assistant pastor for six and a half almost seven years went into evangelism for 25 years he traveled and preached the gospel I have notebooks at home and you open the notebook and there's a name a date a city a state and an age of every person that my dad personally led to Christ in those 32 years and I have in those notebooks over 21,000 names Everywhere we go, we're running into people that my dad led to Christ that are serving in churches today. We, it's, you know, in his preaching, he had over another 11,000 that walked the aisle and trusted Christ as their Savior in the 25 years. He led over 32,000 people to Christ. Why? Because one man, one person said, I'm going to put God's Word first place in my life. I'm going to get excited. I'm going to w- look at the Word of God. I'm going to read it. I'm going to allow the Holy Spirit to teach me. And to show me what God has for me. And I'm going to share it with those around me. And he lived his life according to the word of God. He was a man of integrity. And then when he came by and knocked on the door, my dad said, I have to let him talk to me. I have to because he's living right. He's doing right. He's got something important to say. And he let him come in. And my dad trusted Christ. Can you imagine when Henry gets to heaven one day? If he's not already there. All the awards. The rewards that he's going to see. That he's going to get. He's going to be like, why? God's going to say, remember that one young man that you were faithful to go by and knock on his door? Well, these are rewards to your account because you did what I called you to do. 
because you read the blueprint, you studied and you followed your path, your plan that I individualized for you and you led Monty Watts to Christ. He may have been the only person that Henry ever led to the Lord, but I stand before you to tell you how thankful I am. How thankful I am. Because when I was nine years old, my dad took his old King James Bible and opened it and showed me how I can accept God's free gift of eternal life. And I'm on my way to heaven today because Henry was faithful to share the word of God, to follow the blueprint that God has for him. Maybe God's plan is for you to be a teacher, a preacher, an encourager, a helper, a giver, a bus worker, um, the maintenance, the cleaning, the playing the piano, the singing. They're all vital roles that we must follow using everything that God has given to us to give back to him to reach others for Christ, to exhort one another, to encourage each other. Oh, that we would be faithful, that we may be thoroughly furnished unto all good works, to follow the blueprint that God has put into our hand. When you miss an opportunity to witness, you have no idea the impact that you could have had. If only you had been following God's plan, using the available power and keeping God as first place in your life. When you put God's word first place as priority in your life, you will see a difference in yourself and you will see others differently. Oh, that we would put the word of God as a priority. First place. What's the first thing you think of when you wake up? How many friend requests I got? How many new followers? Or am I going to be a follower of Christ today? Oh, that we would put his word first place. Study to show yourself approved unto God. Study to know what God has for each individual and then obey following that path. Let's have every head bowed, every eye closed. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you again for your word. Lord, we thank you that you've given us your Holy Spirit to guide us, to direct us, to show us what you would have for us each and every day. Lord, help us to desire the daily bread that you've put into our hands. Lord, I pray that you just please to work in our hearts. Lord, help us to be yielded to the Holy Spirit. Lord, help us to, to be searching your word for the plan that you have for each individual. But Lord, help us. Help us to be willing to follow that plan. Lord, we love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand. The Spirit of God spoke to your heart this morning. Altars here. Folks have come. I encourage you to come. Let's do what God tells you to do. If you're here this morning and you've never trusted Jesus as your Savior, if you're in that situation he spoke about, then we're ready to show you how you can know Christ as your Savior. If you'll just let us know you have a need when you come, let us know you want to be saved, and we'll have someone pray with you in that regard. God spoke. I encourage you to come. You don't mind waiting. The Spirit of God is working. Come on. 